welcome everybody to uh, our to everybody to Science Thursday with Brookhaven Lab. Uh, the purpose of Science Thursday is to engage our student and education community in STEM topics by meeting BNL STEM professionals, learn about their work, the career path that got them to where they are today. The hope is at the end of the 45 minutes, uh, you have heard something that will spark your interest in a STEM field, a STEM career, and perhaps even consider being part of the Brookhaven Lab community. I am Aleida Perez from the Office of Educational Programs, and I am joined today by my colleague, Diana Murphy, who will manage the Q&A portion of today's discussion. A couple of, uh, a few reminders, um, for, you know, few rules of engagement, I will say. So you can submit your questions using the Q&A chat section. Uh, we will try to get as many questions as we can today. And if you have any issues or difficulties with the video stream, you can let IT know by making a comment on the chat section. So today uh, I am joined, it's, it's a delight to be joined by James Bianca Rosa. It's a, he's a beamline sound technician at the National Synchrotron Light Source 2 here at Brookhaven Lab. And James is joining us to talk about his career path and the various projects that he has contributed uh, and continue to contribute during his 30 year plus career here at BNL. Welcome, James. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. It's truly a ple pleasure having you here today. I know we've been talking, you know, during the drive runs and so forth. It's truly a pleasure, and I, and I'm looking forward to the conversation and and, and the things that you will share with us today. Uh, so, one thing that I, I I mentioned is that you are a beamline technician for folks that for our young students that might be joining us. What is it that is? What is a beamline technician? A beamline technician essentially helps the scientists take data. So whatever they need, like mechanically, electrically, cryogenically, maybe vacuum stuff, we take care of for them. How many technicians are in your facility? Uh, folks like me, about maybe six or seven. Not okay. that many. Not that to many all for the scientists. Yeah. Yeah, not that many. So your role is very, very critical because yeah. in how to make sure that the experiments do run in the way the scientists would like them, you know, has anticipated them to be. Mm -hmm. um, when you and I were talking about, you mentioned that, and we will talk a little bit later how you you you, you came here to BNL, but your first job here was at the uh, now closed uh, neutron reactor. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what was that experience like? What was, the, you know, when you got to that first job, what did you do there? Well, my, when I, that was my first experience here, right? The, mm -hmm. And it was really overwhelming, honestly, in the mm -hmm. beginning. But uh, my main function there was low temperature physics experiments. So I basically used cryogens like liquid nitrogen and liquid helium to cool down their samples to put on the beam line. And there was neutrons, here is photons. Mm -hmm. To me, similar, you know, it doesn't really make much difference. And so, um, so, so you said that it was very, uh, you know, it, it was new and so it, it was challenging, right? Yeah. Uh, so what, what, what things throughout the years that you were there that you learned that helped you, you know, move on to the different levels? So essentially when I got there, you know, all I really knew how to do is like machining and electronics, but the scientists taught me the fundamentals of cryogenics. And uh, mm -hmm. I really picked up on that. And it's really to this day, probably my best skill is removing heat. Oh. So uh, that's really what I learned. So how do you remove heat? Just curious. Well, it's that's like, say like this pen, can you see it? Mm -hmm. This pen would be yeah. the sample, right? It's sitting in room temperature, right? Now you want to get it cold. So there's no such thing as cold. It's just the lack of heat. So that's mm -hmm. how you get things cold. And, you know, they knew how to, they knew what to do, but they didn't necessarily know how to do it. And so they taught me and I just had a knack for it. And I've been down to almost absolute zero, like 25 millicap, you know, oh, a wow. number of times. You know, mm -hmm. and that's in a dilution refrigerator, which is a mix of 
helium three and helium four and like the helium three comes off the helium four like you sweat on your skin and that's the cooling process of that mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. and we did helium three experiments which is just condensing helium three and pumping on that and regular flow cryostats and pump cryostats and they taught me all of that and I was, all of that in that facility yes in the reactor like i said they knew what to do and i know how to do it and that's always how it's been it sounds right? like you know so so, so there's a partnership right it is it, it is it is a partnership. a partnership so how long were you at the neutron reactor uh probably about 10 years until they closed mm -hmm. you know it was shut and, down by i mm -hmm. don't know however that worked you know they shut it mm -hmm. down and then from the neutron reactor you stay in the lab because I did. you know and, you and did. they said they would get me a job but i found my own job so i went down it's, to rick and the rick uh, which is a relativistic heavy iron collider yeah. and, and i was part of the, the cryogenic group and uh mm -hmm. i was uh actually i qualified as a shift supervisor mechanical tech and electrical tech so mm -hmm. uh, i was able to cover every shift but Oh, wow. That was maybe the most challenging job I've ever did and probably ever will. I mean, that's a How come? incredible system. It's got, if you can imagine when I left, it had like 13,000 inputs and outputs and that across a distributed network about of like two miles. It was yes. really, I mean, in the compressor room at the time, it took 12 and a half megawatts of power to push that liquid around that ring, mm -hmm. you know? So that was some real powerful machine that was all mine, right? They went home at night and that was me, right? Was so what, so, so, so you were doing all the cryo at the, at, at the relativistic heavy ion collider for that time? Yeah, so the, the mm -hmm. experience I gained at the HFBR, I was able mm -hmm. to, implement it into this big machine it's the same principle mm -hmm. so it mm -hmm. just again just came naturally to me you know and uh it was really fun and exciting one thing that you and i were talking about is that we, when that your time at the at the at, at the relativistic heavy iron collider you mentioned to me that you didn't see any scientists yes that was Can the only kind of little drawback because i was used to mm -hmm. working with a scientist but that mm -hmm. was that was a different, that was more of operations, you know? So mm -hmm. I didn't really see any scientists for 10 years, right? I just so how did your day to, So how so, did your day-to-day -day look like then in those 10 years at Trick at the Relativistic? At the, the, it was very important just to keep the ring cold so they could always be taking data, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's that was your main goal is to always have that ring down at temperature every mm -hmm. day you know there's a lot of pressure on us and that's 24 hours a day seven days a week oh so you, you so you okay so you were that basically on call work yeah, yeah so you mm -hmm. were there all the time except in the summertime it was just too much power draw you know so we couldn't run mm -hmm. in the power you know mm -hmm. there's just too much demand on the grid at that time and plus it's just too hot you know and between the compressors and the heat of the day, it used to literally melt the tar off the roof. <laughs> I'm not kidding. You know, it's hot yeah. in there. Yeah, it's hot. Something mm -hmm. that's really cold, right? The heat got to go somewhere. And it's mm -hmm. really mostly water took care of most of that heat, believe it or not. But it was a really uh, intense system. Maybe like, yeah. I wouldn't even bring the, the Rick guys down here, they'd make fun of me, right? <laughs> <laughs> so much less of a system, you know, than that mm -hmm. one. So you were there, you said 13 years, you said 10, about, 13 years, yeah. about that time. Mm -hmm. And so what things that you learned from Rick that now kind of moves you to the next, to your next position, well, which is I, now the one that you have yeah, at the light so source? What, so what happened there was uh, when I was in the HFBR, at nights, mm -hmm. I used to work with a with a scientist called Myron Strongen. You've probably seen he has his own little series of uh, like scientific talks they do in, in uh, physics because, you know, mm -hmm. he since has passed away. But, you know, he was, mm -hmm. you know, he was a really cool guy. But anyway, at night, I used to work with him. We used to do these like sputtering leads and liquid helium and measure stuff all <laughs> night long. So he 
when the NSLS2 st started up, there was the, the flagship beam line was HXN trying to get the smallest beam of x-rays in the world. And that required thin film deposition or sputtering, which I did with Myron. So Myron talked to the fellow that was coming here and they're like, oh, I got a guy for you, Jimmy. And uh, I talked to him and then I decided, wow, this might be something fun. So I left Rick to come to the, the light source. The light source wasn't really even built. We did for three years, did nothing but but make those multi lower lay lenses in uh, 703 with a with a thin film deposition machine that was built over from a CVD in Lake Ronkonkoma. So for three so years, we years. didn't. We were over in 703 until this building was ready for us to like move in. And then um, I would have to say I was, I don't like saying it, but I was like coming kind of like coerced to come over here and actually build the beam line, not just that little optic. I ended up building that whole beam line for them. So one question that, that came from, uh, from the audience, can you let us know what is thin film deposition? Yes. Yeah, so it's kind of like, you could think of it as like, say you have, uh, let me get my pen in the spot there. Say you have a target. Mm -hmm. So the one side of it's plus one, and then you have material that you want to put on that target. So that other side is minus, and then you apply voltage and it takes a little bit of that material and applies it onto your substrate, you know, mm -hmm. and that's, thin film deposition or sputter mm. you could look it up and really that, see I think, how that i think you works. did a very good i, I think that yeah. was very good so actually i think that like, was very good yeah so that's kind of what it what it is and that was pretty incredible those mlls took over like five thousand layers so it was like 13 days or 24 hours a day to make one little lens you know and then we had to cut it and then polish it it was it was quite the ordeal so you were working on the optics, basically, yeah. and the whole optics and, you know, the optics and the, that has to do with it's the just beam. like one little part of the optics of that, you know, there's a whole photon delivery system, but at the mm -hmm. end, at the end station, they need that one last little piece Let's to get that in. smallest little beam. And we kind of mm -hmm. did it, you know, I think we got the record, right? <laughs> the smallest beam of x-rays in the world, usable anyway. Yeah, so it looks like you were working on the optics that for the focusing yeah. of that beam yes. line. So yes. for the folks that don't know, 703 is one of the spaces here at Brookhaven Lab. It's a lab space, it's a manufacturing right. space. So that's a, as a space that uh, James uh, did a lot of this work for this very important beam line. But like James said, it was the very first one, right? right? That was commissioned here at the NSLS too, and the natural synchrotron lights are still um, by the time it's open. Um, I know that that when you and I were talking, um, the heart x-ray, this very first beam line, the 3 ID was the very first one you worked for three years. But I know that you have been, you have contributed or you have been part of other beam lines constructions. Yeah. Can you tell a little bit about that? I can. Uh, once, you know, because there was only a few of us technicians, we like kind of banded together in the beginning, <laughs> you know, and uh, we really worked all together and, and we built like any, the first, I think it was six, was the first six and uh, we really all banded together to get all of those six up and operating. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a really good time for us. Yeah, I bet. It's like, uh, you know, it's, it's building a new machine, it's building a new toy, right? So right, everything yeah. is, it's, uh, it's exciting and it's new. So yeah. now, uh, uh, so your day to day, you support many, many, many experimental stations, what the beam yeah. lines that we call it, many experimental stations or the beam lines at the various uh, sites of the light source, right? Correct. Yeah. I must say, James, that I do, uh, uh, I, I, I will say that I, when I'm on the floor, I have seen you running this. It's, it's, a, it's great how you or your team takes care of the users and the scientists and make sure that yeah. the instrument runs the way we expected it to be, we hope to be. Um, are there, a question in the chat, and I see if that one is says something to what is the differences between the beam lines? So are all the beam lines the same? No, they, they separate them into like five programs, you know, and it's kind of mm -hmm. like, 
hard x-rays, soft Mm x-rays, you know, imaging type of guys, you know, Mm -hmm. soft, you know, I I don't know so much about them. And, and honestly, to me, they're very similar, you know, they're all parts and pieces, nuts and bolts and washers and wires, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, but from my point of view, they're very similar to the scientists, they can't be any more different, you know? So if, if I hear you, James, so from your point of view, they have the similar components. You find similar materials yeah. that make yeah. up those. So in, 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 the, in the building part of it, there's not much difference that you there's see in any of them? Not as far as a technician would, would notice, you know? Mm-hmm. Some vacuum systems have to be a little cleaner than others, but me personally, I try to give as much love as I can to everyone. <laughs> it just naturally works out. <laughs> right. So Yeah. That's that's actually cool. Um I know that uh you have been recognized by your peers at the NSLS user community uh with that recognition that was given to you. Can you tell a little bit about that? Yeah, that was the NSLS2 user community service award that I won. And that was for 7ID. That was, even though HXN, the first one was a big beam line, this Mm -hmm. one is bigger and it's like a subway. It has a bunch of different beam lines right off the same beam line, you know? So there's like three, four, five scientists on the one beam line, five head guys, you know, on Mm -hmm. one beam line. So that one beam line is like five beam lines. And uh, I was lucky enough to be able to like coordinate that and get that together. And that's why they uh, gave me that award because it was a little different than most of them because most of them Mm -hmm. are purely all new parts. This one was new and old parts. So it was like, if you think of it in terms of like a car, it'd be like a resto mod, you know, it'd be like (laughs) part new, part old, you know, looks old, but it's really new inside, you know? So it was really challenging and fun. And I got to say, the folks from 7ID. Uh, Cherno, I'll give a shout out to you because he's still my favorite scientist right now, right? <laughs> so those and just are so really folks, nice guys, you know? So the, so the folks out here, 7ID, uh, you're looking at 7ID 1 and 2, right? Yeah. That's the, those, those are the spectroscopy, uh, the, the, you know, self-energy type of beams. Yeah. So you build that from new parts and old parts, just mm-hmm. combining like you said, that that is uh, that has its challenges. And they weren't really BNL, you know. They're like outside people, so it was a, mm-hmm. even a little more difficult to get resources. It was challenging, but very exciting and fun. <laughs> Sounds like a, that was very very cool. Um, when you and I were talking, uh, you shared something uh, with us because you have been here for thirty years. Yeah, I've something been here like since that. Right out of high school, uh, and we, 1987. Yeah, we would, yeah, we yeah. will talk a little bit about that soon. So you've been here for a long time, and you have been part of the BR community, and you have taken, you know, you have taken, uh, you have contributed greatly to the work and the science that is done here. And you had learned, you know, you also acquired, uh, you know, knowledge uh, and, 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 and skills. So now you are at a point when you are the lead of a project. Is that correct? Yeah, actually. So it's probably the only good thing that happened during COVID is uh, they wouldn't let me work. So they sent me home, <laughs> right? They sent me home with this software called Fusion 360. It's an Autodesk product. And mm-hmm. uh, I wasn't so happy about the drawing, but it was kind of cool. But it was the machining part that really got my interest that once I had a drawing, I could like click on it and, you know, essentially have CNC machines make that for me. I don't got to bend over and look at it and like actually by hand do it anymore. The machine does it for me. So, so James, for, for, sorry to interrupt you, for folks that don't know what CNC is, what is that it's stand for computer numerical controlled so it's it's mm. it's the all you do is kind of just here, here i'll show you it's my new tool it's just a usb stick right this is <laughs> this is my new tool right the drawing Got goes it. on that that goes into the machine and then the machine does it you know so that was mm-hmm. my proposal is a what i call the modern fabrication shop do you want me to show the slides that you sure, share we, we can start off with that Give me one moment. Can you see them, James? Yeah, I can. Okay. So, let me. Mm-hmm. 
you want me to just go i'll just go yep so uh, whatever <laughs> the, it's actually andy barber who's my supervisor she kind of coined this phrase the modern fabrication shop because my old shop my lathe is literally a 1942 right runs on vacuum tubes but i love it mm. but i feel like we need to move forward so this is this is was my idea right to have mm -hmm. like under one roof and relatively quickly to to make stuff instead of having to like go through designers and then maybe go through the shops and then come back and and it still don't fit so i thought maybe we could make the prototype here and then send it to the shops to make a million of them so that was like kind of my idea on mm -hmm. this this plan and this scope so it's really essentially just uh like five machines you know a 3d printer a laser cutter a cnc mill a cnc router and a cnc lathe and, and you can go to the next slide if you like and so this is like a little example of like this thing didn't work right so we <laughs> figured out like most things they science just don't work right, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? yeah that's like the science. R and research mm -hmm. we do, right? <laughs> That's what I say. Mm -hmm. But uh, so if you could see, like this little pod needed a, a spot for wires, and I could have done that the old-fashioned way with ninety degrees. But now with the CNC and the drawing, it can do anything I can imagine. So, like it had those nice little flows, curves for the wires, and then I was able to make the little cap for it. And believe it or not, this little washer right here is the whole start of everything. It's my first 3D model because they were trying to, if you could, it's hard to see, but these connectors had to be spaced just right because that goes on top of this thing and they got to make connections. Mm -hmm. And they had it stacked with all these washers and it just didn't work out. And I was like, oh, we could just print this and like, would it take like a one second to print that thing? And mm -hmm. then it spaced it out perfectly, milled the little slots, made the little caps, you know, and then even made it this other thing to protect the, the wires, you know, because why not? You can just do it. And exactly. you can go to the next screen, right? And uh, again, it, it's just a, a one stop, one room, one way to fix stuff, right? Now, if you want to make a million of these, I'm not interested. Someone else can make a million, but we got this one working, you know, and here's a little blurb from uh, Bruce Revelle. This was his like little project, you know, and uh, if you if you read it, you could see that he's really into it and it really helped him a lot, you know, mm -hmm. and it's it's really what it is. It's just no more compromise anymore. You get exactly what you want, whether you like it or not. You, I, one more slide is there, I think. Yes. Uh, yes, the one more. Let me get it. Yeah, and this is so. This was like the the monies that we figured out how much it would cost, and since it was that was in February, and they actually approved this a proposal. So this is actually going to happen. They gave me all this money to make this shop, and I'm pretty proud of myself. You know, I can't wait for it to happen. That's awesome. It is. I'm gonna. I'm gonna stop sharing a little bit here. Actually, that's that's great. That is yeah. great. So you hope that when you so you already started to do the 3D printing and, and yeah, and we have so. some stuff here already, but I wanted like my own, you know, I got to like ask mm -hmm. people, I got to go to chemistry and beg and I got to beg engineering. Can we do this? And I thought maybe just so the techs could have a shop of their own to like mm -hmm. do this. You know, I'm not going to be here forever, you know, so I, it's like a little legacy thing, too, you know, like. When I'm gone, Agreed. this will still be there. And it, it affords them not to have all this years and years of machine practice, right? You could jump right in and do this, you know? I Anybody. think that's, uh, that thing that is, that is actually great. The way you said is the legacy, right? Yeah. Your, yeah. your legacy. And I, and I, and I think um, that is very, is that, that's a very worth of wisdom and a worth of value. So now that you have all this proposal, funded when is as a started yet or not yet right it there's this they still got to get like uh there's some like room issues you know they got to swip swap some people yeah and they still got to make like a project and activity account for it but it's gonna happen shortly you know yeah it, 
And then the longer the bureaucratic they wait, thing. I told them the longer you wait, I'll be able to spend that money in one day because all my ducks <laughs> will be in a line, you know. <laughs> so I'll just be able to, you know. So uh, yeah, it so, could happen so, uh, any moment. Any moment. That's what it sounds like. I think it's yeah. a. I, I think it's it's a, it's just. I really think it's it's great, James. Uh, I like the I like the 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 whole idea of of you know making the process more modern, faster. And and you're able to to build this in a in a large you know with larger numbers, so you don't have to wait really for the piece of process to be brought from someplace else. No, because you know we do a lot of like one of stuff, you know, and like mm -hmm. what, what we call quick and dirty, so we could see if it's going to work, and then we can refine it later, you know. But now mm -hmm. we can get it done and see if it's going to work. Do we want to move forward, you know? So, you know, mm -hmm. just a real need. And like I said, it was all because of really COVID, right? I was home with this book and the software and I was like, man, what have I been doing all these years? <laughs> <laughs> so now, now you have another piece, you know, to add to it on another, another new token. And I think that comes out of the, 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 it's an acknowledgement to your experience. I, I feel James, all yeah. these years of, of, of supporting the science that is done here at BNL. I think this is just a, a great culmination to, in that acknowledgement of, of, of that time. And I can say congratulations yeah. about oh, that. Thank you. Because I did stick so, out like a sore thumb in those proposals. <laughs> I can tell you that. <laughs> so James, so we are about 427, close to 430. So I know that I'm going to ask you this question because you, I, I, when we first talked, but it's not like to pick your, you, you know, it's not like when we have the people who are children, sometimes we ask, you know, not, not to pick your favorite child, but I'm, I'm sure that this is probably one of your most proudest project, this proposal that you just showed to us. Put that aside. What will be your, you know, your, your second most proud moment in terms of the contributions you have made here at BNL? I got to say, uh, I got to say 3ID and 7ID, they were like monster projects, you know? And uh, in fact, when I first met Young with the HXN, he started going off on, oh, we got to do this. We got, and I was like, Young, shh, we need tools. We just need tools. We can do this, right? I don't know what you're talking mm -hmm. about, but we need tools, right? And we did it. And you got, yeah, and it's a beautiful it. beam line. We, yeah. didn't, we didn't make first light. Stuart Wilkins made first light at CSX, but I got to mm -hmm. say, I helped him to get there, you know? Yeah. So uh, it was really exciting time, you know, and, yes. I, and I try to let it be every day, you know, yeah. I do. I, I like that when you talk with pride, you know, there's, there's a lot of pride in how you tell it's, us. It's my life, you know, it's I spend life. most mm -hmm. of my waking hours here, mm -hmm. right? So, and yeah. I have, you know, this is what I do. Yes. Right. When they yes. say, when a work-life balance, people came up to me, I said, work is my life, right? <laughs> yes. It is. It's yes, just, it these is. are my friends. These, this is my hobby, right? And I'm almost done. You know, I almost put in my time, you know? So I just got a little bit more to go, you know? And I want to give that last little push. And I think this is it. You know, this, yeah, sounds like this is it. will be the, you know, this will be my little crowning achievement. Mm -hmm. So, uh, James, so for the folks, so the students that might be listening, let's just kind of shift a little bit and talk about how you got to BNL. Uh, because you and I talked about it, and I think it's it's a story to be told. So, how do you end up here? How do you became you were? How do you came so, from? So in to high here? school, I was I, I I won't say like a bad kid, but I was kind of a bad kid because like I really suffered terribly from dyslexia. Believe it or not, I mm -hmm. do not know my right from my left. I mm -hmm. can barely read and write. I struggle all the time. So. Uh, I was sent to BOCES and uh, I learned machining and electronics and uh, I knew how to measure metal and voltage. And I've been able to hang with these guys ever since, you know? So from BOCES, so did somebody at BOCES knew somebody? How did you, how did uh, that connection? something that was called uh, from BOCES. They hooked me up to a place, something called the job shopping agency. And mm -hmm. uh, they sent me here to the lab. And uh, I interviewed at the HFDR, and that's how it started. You know, and that was 1988. Yeah, February of 88 is when I officially worked here. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So so you do have so so for the thing the students that are thinking here that you know not every that would like to be part of the STEM world and into you know laboratories like BNL and settings like ours, um, and don't you know are not following traditional you know scientific path. Uh, what kind of preparation you will suggest that they do? Do this at both. So you took. So what you suggest that they do if they want to be a, a technician here at the laboratory and contribute the way you contribute to this to our science. I feel like if you're going to do something like I do, you got to really be a person that wonders like how stuff happens. How did it get there? Right. How does that work? Right. And mm -hmm. if you have that in you, I can make you a technician. Right. Because because everything like is you build off of something, you know. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's that's you have to have an open mind and, and listen and, and want to be able to learn. And I think anybody could really do it, you know. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a question in the chat that uh, with all the different jobs you had here, did you have to go back to school to learn anything or did you learn everything from the scientist? I pretty much learned everything from here, you know? I mean, I always say it, I was like, all I really needed to know to work with these guys is how my mini bike worked when I was eight years old. I still feel mm -hmm. like I haven't broke through that knowledge. I haven't needed any more than that. You know, because everything mm -hmm. is fundamental, you know, righty tighty lefty loosey everything works the same if you just break things down into little compartments and then you build off of that you can understand the most complicated thing. You know that's mm -hmm. just how I do it, you know bits mm -hmm. at a time and then just build off of it. Yeah, yeah, there's a yes, I that's, believe in the the, the the idea of the fundamental piece, right? Yeah, you and know, you understand, every, and then you can apply it to, to you, you can understand the fundamentals that you can apply them to the various yeah, yeah. roles that you do. I mean, some things are like a little counterintuitive, but it's just then it's not, it's not left and it's right, try right, right? And then it's you're mm -hmm. gonna find your way. You feel that, uh, do you feel like a uh, part of being a part of the job, the job that you do is also being able to take risk, you know, I, in, a, in a way, in a, I, but in a way I, that- I'm that, a big mm -hmm. person that works from like a gut feeling and a heart yes. like type of thing, you know? So if I feel like it's gonna work, I'm gonna try it, right? And mm -hmm. if it doesn't work, I learn something from that. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. another saying that I have is like, people without education, we learn through deduction, what not to do. Mm -hmm. Right. And mm -hmm. that's how you gain your skill set. Got it. That's that's yes. Well said. I, I know that um, there have been many people throughout your life that uh, that have been part of uh, your advocates and supporters. Uh, any any of these mentors have been very important to you? Any mentor that has yeah, stood out say, that have been uh, very my, important in your career? My first supervisor, Frank Langdon. Uh, it almost brings a tear to my eye. He's the one who taught me how to be like a patriot and care, you know? So uh, he taught me everything, you know? It's mm. because of him is why I am today, you know? Because we, because not everybody has the opportunity to do something great, you know? We do, you know? We could do something great for the whole entire universe, not just mm -hmm. America. I mean, the whole world, you know, the whole mm -hmm. everything. So, you know, most days I know we squander it, but that's just human nature, but we do have that opportunity here. So, you know, I try to take advantage of it. That's, that's great, that's great. Um, for, if you have any questions, you're welcome to put them on the Q and A. Um, James, um, any advice for the, any advice for, for our folks? Um, Anything that you, you think that we have missed in terms of what kind of last advice you can give to our I, folks? I feel like if the best advice I could give anybody is really just be open-minded and listen, right? And just listen, right? You don't have to do it that way, but you got to take advice from other people in other stations in life. Like, I mean, I'm like a box turtle. I never been off of Long Island hardly, right? I don't go mm -hmm. past exit 64, but yet <laughs> I know people all over the world, you know, from working here. Yeah. But I listen, you know, I may not do what they say, but at least I listen, you know, mm -hmm. and I feel like that's the most important thing is to listen, right? And, Does, and just listen, right? Really listen. 
You know, yeah, not just and pretend I, to and take it in, yeah. you know? It might mm-hmm. be something good. It might not be, but it might be, you know? Mm-hmm. So I feel like that's the most important part of here anyway, because there's so many, there's a million ways to do things, right? A million ways, but you kind of want to do it the smartest, fastest, best way, you know? Mm-hmm. And and you, the only way you get to do that is by like, listening from other people and taking advice and this who's going to know all this stuff right one person can't do all this yeah. you know mm-hmm. i'm like a million people help me to get where i am mm-hmm. you know i just like to drive the bus you know that's my <laughs> part right i you know i want to live and die by my own decisions you know and i do it mm-hmm. every day i think it's a great that you know you said that we all we are all pieces of this big puzzle that is the right. science that we do here. And so uh, I think uh, I, I find what you just, you know, you're, you're, you're talking to us today, inspiring. I think uh, I think it's, it's important that folks hear that we are very different players and different people that play roles, very important roles at any level right. at the laboratory, and that we all contribute to the science that we do all to at our you know we all contribute to it and that's an important message to send um so we know any other further question james i i i thank you so much You're this welcome. was this was this was wonderful thank you for your time thank you for uh for all that you do for the work that you do good mm-hmm. luck with this proposal uh good luck with the with the uh the um the fast the modern the modern fabrication shop facility i'm going to call it a facility now you know that means it's going to be big yeah. uh a facility and and truly i say to you thank you and to our audience uh thank you for staying with us today our next we welcome uh back um please remind us of the next science thursday which is june 18 uh please join us then We'd like to thank Brookhaven National Laboratory for hosting this event today and encourage you to check our programs and i think um Diana is going to put our BNL education website on the chat. Check out our potential opportunities and check out our summer science exploration programs, our virtual offerings for students from K from fourth grade to 12th grade. Please stay safe. Please stay safe. And we will be with you uh, next time uh, on Science Thursday. Have a good day. <laughs>